this genetics, this molecular biology that was the answer to all the questions I'd ever had about everything. We were just trying to be scientists. We certainly didn't want to be seen as troublemakers. People said, what happens in the field stays in the field. It was bullying from day one. He would tell me women were altering the science on the ice for worse. What's going to happen if I report him? What happens if I don't report him? It was getting really physical. I didn't tell anybody because who's going to believe you? You know, nobody. Women are extraordinarily underrepresented in science. When you ask somebody, draw a picture of a scientist, it used to be all men. There's a playbook, and it was written by men. And I always felt I didn't have the playbook. <laughs> you know, I'm just feeling my way through this game. You get used to being underestimated. You get used to being invisible. These are great scientists. How can they not believe this? Many of the women that I've spoken to have left. This is the leaky pipeline. They cannot say the evidence doesn't exist. So I thought, OK, I have to show them it's true. So I wrote, there's a kind of systemic and invisible discrimination against women. Can we really afford to lose those top scientists? He just needs to look at the data. That's what he'd want us to do for his science. You cannot do everything on your own. You need enough of your allies to make something happen. I expected to fight alone. I didn't expect anybody else to fight with me. Together, we can do better. Let's move away from a culture of compliance and towards a culture of change. If you don't have women, you've lost half the best people. Look at the talent of these women. This is worth fighting for. Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us for this special discussion of Picture a Scientist, an award-winning film that's changing the conversation regarding gender bias, discrimination, and harassment in science, technology, engineering, and math. Thanks to three courageous women, one of whom is here today, the film gave us a glimpse of the roadblocks and the realities often faced by female scientists and engineers. How do you picture a scientist? How should you? And what can we all do to broaden the STEM circle and embrace everyone? Our conversation today is designed to explore that subject a bit further, and we have a vibrant group of panelists who are ready to do so. But first, a special thank you to those who've made our program possible. The Livermore Lab Foundation, a 501c3 nonprofit organization supporting the fundamental science and research at Lawrence Livermore National Lab, collaborated with the lab's Women's Association and diversity, equity, and inclusion programs to bring both the film and this discussion to our community. We're grateful for the vision, leadership, and planning efforts of lab employees, Janessa Dozier, Nadine Horner, Terry Stearman, Sheila Dixon, Marianne Albright, Carrie Martin, Joanna Abala, as well as the foundation team of Sally Allen, Donna Crawford, Lori Taylor, and Emily Pirano. We also want to acknowledge our colleagues at Bumblebee Marketing and their assistance on our Zoom presentation today. And now a bit of housekeeping. Over the next 90 minutes, we'll break down our discussion into three distinct themes, beginning with first, what we saw in the documentary, second, what it means to science, and finally, how we might change the paradigm. In each segment, we'll feature a film clip to help us set the stage, and we'll answer a few video questions. And now, let's meet our panelists with a brief introduction. Dr. Kim Budell is the director of Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, one of the nation's premier applied science and research facilities. She has more than three decades of experience in science and national security, with leadership positions at the lab, University of California, and the Department of Energy. Jason Cruz is a systems engineer at the lab, supporting weapons and complex integration in the superblock. He's also chair of the Asian Pacific American Council, leading and supporting the greater Asian Pacific Islander community at the lab. Dr. Daryl Foster is the president of Las Positas College, located in Livermore. 
It is one of 116 community colleges in the state of California, the largest system of higher education in the country. He began his tenure at LPC last year and comes to the college with more than 20 years of experience in leadership and administrative roles. Monique Warren is an environmental engineer with the Environmental Restoration Department at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. She's also a former co-chair of the African-American Body of Laboratory Employees, also known as ABLE, an employee resource group that works to promote communication and cultural diversity at the lab. Dr. Jane Willenbring is an associate professor of geological sciences at Stanford and is one of the featured scientists in the film. Her story resonates from her time in the master's program at Boston University. Dr. Willenbring's research focuses on problems related to the Earth's surface and how landscapes are affected by tectonics, climate change, and life. She joined Stanford in the summer of 2020. Panelists, thank you all. We appreciate you taking the time to share your experiences and insights today. And we have more than 400 attendees who signed up for our webinar. And we're to help us set the stage, we thought we'd start with just kind of a quick poll to see who's here. You should be able to see on your screen now um, a poll that will help us get to know you better. There's a number of categories listed on that. And what we'd like to do is have you check where you are from so that later on we can um, talk about it a little bit. As part of that, we are going to be um, addressing your questions as well. And so at the end of our panel discussion, after we've broken down to our three panels, you'll see our presentation kind of end with questions from you. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A section. Submit that question if you'd like. If you see a question that you think it resonates with you, you may also upvote for it at the bottom of the question. And then Sally Allen from Livermore Lab Foundation will be sharing those with us as well. So let's go back to our poll and see where people are from. Can we share that results of the poll right now so everyone can see it on screen? So it looks like 84% are from employees at the laboratory. And then we've got a good group of students. Welcome summer students. We so appreciate you being here, community members and folks from uh, the foundation as well. So thank you all for doing that. Let's jump right in, panelists. One of the most important analogies, metaphors in the film was the iceberg. It actually resonated from the National Academies of Sciences talking about the iceberg and what's hidden below. Let's go back to the film for a moment and start with that clip and take our conversation from there. We use the metaphor of an iceberg to really get across the various forms of sexual harassment. What's gotten most of the attention is unwanted sexual attention, coercion. Those are in the public eye, and I think everyone would agree we absolutely need to address those. And then you have all the stuff that's underneath. Those are actually more than 90% of the sexual harassment. You know, the subtle exclusions, being left off an email, not being invited to a collaboration where you're the clear expert, just these little moments that make a woman feel like she doesn't belong, that's a really common experience. We found that consistent gender harassment actually has the same impact as a single episode of unwanted sexual attention or coercion. So it is not something to be ignored. Such a powerful analogy and Jane, you were the perfect person to kick us off on this because I'd like to understand, you know, why is this such a difficult subject to talk about and how has that analogy of the iceberg resonated for so many people who've watched this film? I think it's a really powerful, first of all, thank you so much for having me and for having this discussion. Um, I think it's such a powerful analogy because it brings up so many different concepts of what can be missing from our experiences that we that we haven't really thought about if we're on the receiving end and what maybe we have given if we're on the other end or what we have witnessed if we're on the other end. And, you know, I think that one of the other um, things that I think about a lot are the survivorship bias of the experiences of women that we talk to in STEM fields, 
So we are not really, even in, you know, all of those um, shocking statistics that we heard in the film where like, you know, 60% of women who do field sciences have been sexually harassed. Um, those are people who are still in the field. So we're not getting the people who were actually harassed out of the field. So that is important. And Kim, I know you have felt very strongly about this subject as well. Yes, I think the interesting thing about uh, the bulk of the iceberg is the fact that as a woman, your reaction to most of these things is it's something about me or it's unique to me. And they tend to be individually very small. And I think that's the point. They accumulate over time. So it's very hard to get a sense that there's some uh, you know, systemic problem that you're encountering. Uh, there's a very powerful moment in the film where Nancy Hopkins finally talks to other women at MIT. And what's amazing in that moment is she realizes it isn't just me. You know, this is happening to all of us. And I think that sense of the cumulative impact uh, is really important. And let's take that analogy that Nancy had in the film where she goes, aha, there is more to even broaden it to our women of color, to our diverse populations. So Monique and Daryl and Jason, I know that this is important to you because we may have thought about it just as women in this film, but in reality, the iceberg is for all diverse populations. Monique. I thought Dr. Rachel in the film did such a great job of showing the difficulty of being at the intersection of more than one diverse background. I know for me as a woman, uh, as a black woman and as a young woman, um, sometimes when you know things happen to you, you're like, wait, is it because I'm a woman? Is it because I'm a person of color? Is it because I'm young? And that confusion can make you spend more time uh, analyzing things and trying to figure out how to respond to situations. And it makes things so much harder. Daryl, any thoughts? Yeah, you know, for me, you know, the film that really described these experiences as, as microaggressions is how I, I term, um, you know, those behaviors. And so I'm going to be a little candid here, Susan, if, if you don't mind. And, and really, as, as I think about you know, myself who is a black and Korean male of color, you know, and for others who come from more marginalized underrepresented communities, re-experience, you know, discrimination, these type of microaggressions, um, which are much more common, um, not only at work, at school, but our entire lives, right? So these experiences uh, with microaggressions begin at an early age. And so those feelings and emotions are things that we live with. Um, and so for both men and women of color, you know, to be successful in our careers, but to still have to deal with, you know, the toxic and harmful demeaning experiences at work and in our everyday life. It's, it's frustrating and tiring. So, you know, what I, I would like to share, Susan, is that it's, it's so important, you know, to people from marginalized communities, for women and people of color to have allies, right? And, and those bystanders and colleagues uh, who advocate on our behalf, it's not that we can't advocate for ourselves, but it's such a burden and it's a huge responsibility that we've carried our entire lives. And so to not have to carry that burden or that emotional labor, that means men being allies and supporting women, uh, our white colleagues being allies and supporting people of color, to have that support from our colleagues and our friends is so welcomed and needed. Thank you, Daryl. And we're going to talk about ways that we can do that as part of our last segment. Jason, I know this was a powerful analogy for you. Share your thoughts on that. Thanks for having me. Um, I think the analogy speaks volumes. Uh, I mean, of course, at the tip of the iceberg, you see right now the xenophobia and the, xen and the blatant attacks, but, but lying beneath, um, well, speaking personally, in my, in my Filipino culture, um, I was taught growing up not to make waves, forgive the pun, not, not to make trouble. And a lot of members in our community uh, may relate to that as well. And if you couple that with the Asian American model minority myth that our community doesn't experience racism, I hope you can see that we have an even harder time you know, voicing our concerns. And you don't have to be female or Asian to be apprehensive about, about speaking up. So I think all of us can, can definitely relate. You can be a new employee and think, I have this amazing job at the national lab and I don't wanna do anything to jeopardize this, this, this opportunity. Uh, so I think the nuance in our identities multiply the icebergs that we all have to deal with. 
Okay, we'll talk about the icebergs as we go forward. Monique, one of the things that you just mentioned was, should I say something? When do I say something? How do I say something? And that leads us to our first video question from Janessa that actually addresses this exact issue. Let's take a look. Hello, my name is Janessa Dozier and I'm the Administrator for Diversity, Equity and Inclusion at the Lab within the Director's Office and the President of the Lawrence Livermore Laboratory Women's Association. My question goes to the conflict that many women have on this issue when they experience something. Do I say something or do I pretend that it didn't happen? Do I confront the issue later or do I let it go? And if I do speak out, how will I be perceived and will it be worth it? For Kim, Monique, and Jane, I am curious what approaches may have worked for you in navigating these conflicting feelings and thoughts. Thank you, Janessa, for that question. So Kim, can you start us up on that? What approaches work best? So I've used different approaches across the arc of my career. Um, one of my uh, go-to reflexes in those circumstances is to uh, turn to humor to de-escalate the situation, but to still uh, make sure that I can note it uh, and, and redirect the conversation. I think one of the challenges is trying to send a message without saying, you're a bad person, um, you know, don't do that again, you know, to try to build relationships that are more productive. Um, I've also been very lucky to have many partners and allies and advocates uh, on my behalf who, um, you know, who have built relationships with me and then are willing to step up, step in uh, at times where I perhaps didn't feel as confident making that, that type of intervention. Um, today, I really feel obliged both for myself and others. I'm in a position where I can and so I try to take that part very seriously when I see more junior colleagues having issues. I really try to step up and uh, help mediate the situation. Good, good idea. Jane. Well, if people have seen the film, you know <laughs> that I'm very much a pragmatic <laughs> in my response to such things. So I, I feel like, you know, I, I take very much a survivor or a victim um, perspective or centered perspective in that I think that you need to protect your safety and that can be the safety of your career and your sense of well-being um, before you try to change the system very much. You know, I mean, I feel like a lot of people think that, you know, they get inspired to do something and they want to do it right away. Um, and I think that that's great. And sometimes that works out, but I also think that, you know, it, it doesn't do, um, our, our field or us any good for people to put themselves at risk, put their careers at risk. If you know what's, if you think, you know, what's going to happen. Um, and if you don't, um, prioritize your, your own health and your own self-care, so I think that that's something that, that people should think about. I mean, um, go for it <laughs> if, you, if you're willing, but I think that that's something that people might not realize how much goes into making a full-blown report. Mm -hmm. Monique, any tactics that you've used that have worked successfully for you? I think remember, for me, it's remembering that no matter the scale, I mean, we saw a lot of aggressions shared in the film and like Dr. Foster was sharing that there are also microaggressions that occur in the workplace. And no matter the scale, things really do need to be addressed at some point. Um, there's a training at the lab called Moments That Matter. And what I appreciate about that training is it helps us to address things in the moment that they happen because that's when it's most potent. Um, and I think what Jane pointed out in the film was very impactful to me that if I don't take the time to address what happens to me when it happens to me and um, to speak up in some form um, that it'll impact people down the line. So I can help generations down the line experience less uncomfortable moments if I'm willing to be uncomfortable today. And I think for all of us, when we watched the film, it took us back to 
moments in our life where we suddenly looked at things a little bit differently than what had happened at the time and went, oh my gosh. And I know Jason, when you and I had a conversation about the film, as a bystander, you almost felt guilty on some things that had happened in your previous life. And, and should I have reacted differently? How does a bystander, like an Adam, Jane, we wanna hear from you on this too, how does a bystander handle it? And what is the best approach? Thanks, Susan. Yes, Jane, I, I can't tell you how much I identify with your colleague, Adam, about thinking about wanting to be a good ally and not living, living up to it. And when Adam said, I didn't recognize what was happening um, because there were instances um, I realized I didn't have, oh, sorry about that. I didn't have the empathy to recognize when people around me were hurting. And, and even to this day, I, I do struggle with this um, about how to be you know, a good ally. And about the, the question of how to approach this is, um, just like I said earlier, I think we should establish a, a safe environment where we can discuss you know, with that person and identify yourself you know, as, an, as a supportive ally and acknowledge what happened. Talk about what you observed, I noticed, I felt, I saw, I heard. And then ask them, what do they want to do? And let them decide what's in their best interest. And if they want to, then you can go ahead and find resources. Yeah. Jane, were there a lot of visceral reactions to Adam in the film? Because I, I think a lot of people did and would find it somewhat contradictory on what he said. Yeah. Yeah, people like either really like Adam. <laughs> I mean, I think everyone thinks that he's a really powerful, you know, sort of um, presence in the in the movie. But I think that some people either get like a lot out of it or they want to throw something at the screen <laughs> when they listen to him. And um, I guess I have that perspective as well of being like, how how did you not know? You know, like this this was so like outside of the realm of what should happen, and you know a a professional environment. But I think, you know, one of the things that that I hope that people take from this is not like saying, oh, Adam did the wrong thing. He should have done something else. But to actually think like, when, when have I been an Adam? Like, have there been meetings when there were, you know, people of color, women of color in the room, and I did not speak up for them? So, you know, it's kind of easy to say like, he should have done something else where if we, if we really think about it, there have been many, many times, you know, um, where we have done that same thing. And I think that that's so much more of a, a productive way to think about him. I, I really like that because we, you're right. We all have been an Adam in one phase or another and that we could have done more, but didn't and need to examine why we didn't. I think that also brings us to the subject of star scientists or generational issues. And, you know, you hear from um, people who may have worked at the laboratory or in science fields, you know, years and years ago, and they are, it's just this light bulb moment because they go, but that's the way we always did things. So I'm wondering, is this a generational issue? Is this a star scientist issue? Because we all know that sometimes people will you know, walk gently around star scientists for fear that they're going to leave our institution or not work on a, an important project. How do we handle that? And, and how can younger generations help us change that paradigm? Kim, can you start us off on that? Sure. <clears throat> and I'll just note, you know, I came through my graduate career and, and early career in an era where many more women were going into science than the era, for example, when Nancy Hopkins was coming up. And yet the culture was strikingly similar. I mean, there was a new generation of people in the workplace, but the same cultural imperatives were still at play. Um, on the star scientist question, uh, my observation is the following. It's just easier for people to ask 10 reasonable people to be accommodating than to ask one difficult person to change their behavior. So we have to really grapple with that. I mean, nobody at the end of the day is truly that valuable. You think about all the lost productivity, all the lost contributions, all the psychic weight that the rest of the community is carrying because of that approach, um, we really need to deal with it very directly, I think. And what about generational issues? You know, do you, I know, especially at the laboratory, I think 50% of the laboratory has, has just been employed there five years or more. So we're really seeing a, a shift, a paradigm shift in a new group of scientists and engineers coming into leadership positions. Yes, and it is notably different. Uh, and the attitudes of our earlier career staff are very 
Uh, they have much higher expectations on this front for how we will deal with, really deal with in a meaningful way, behavior in the workplace. Um, and for us, it's a very interesting line to walk because we're a science and technology organization. Uh, the goal is to get the work right, to have a culture that's intellectually challenging, that um, exercises our intellect every day to ensure we're doing the best work with the highest integrity and always moving toward better solutions, better answers. That can easily cross that line and everyone has a different level of sensitivity to how, how vigorous a debate is about the science and how much of that is about the person. So we're opening a really interesting conversation with our um, earlier career staff on this exact topic. How do we strike that balance appropriately and make sure we keep the good parts of this uh, scientific culture of debate without and keep it about ideas uh, and stay away from the part where it really is very personal and about the people and corrosive. And that begs the question of going back even further to the education system. And Daryl, I'm hoping that you might be able to weigh in on this because you know, science, especially at the grad student level um, and beyond, is really built on that faculty student dynamic and the interplay on, on projects in labs. Is that by its very nature problematic? Should we re-examine how in Jane's situation she was beholden to her, you know, advisor on, on this project and really was fearful for her career? Should she get him, the ire of him going? So how do we look at that at a, at a community college level, at a university level, at a grad and PhD level to say, is this a new dynamic we need to be exploring? Yeah, great question. You know, Susan, this interdependence, it is dynamic and it often consists of varying degrees, right, of intersectionality. And so, you know, we know that this power dynamic is particularly pervasive, right, in academia, as you mentioned. And so, you know, where those in leading positions such as faculty often occupy one or more of those identities that hold power within these structures, it's, it's important for the faculty first to recognize that they are positioned in these structures of power based on their own identities. And so it really starts with that self-awareness uh, because their positionality then informs their perspective and that, you know, self-awareness and understanding is important. Um, but as you mentioned also, this is a systemic issue. And, and to address it though, I, I think it comes down to really mutual understanding, right? And, and part of that comes through training to ensure that both the faculty and the student have a mutual understanding of their roles and, and their expectations. Um, I think clarifying those expectations uh, that the faculty and students have of each other, um, I think that can uh, help both uh, parties be more mindful and can help foster better communication and, and a more productive working relationship. It's challenging as we saw in the film and, and what Jane had experienced, of course. So I think, you know, we also have to ensure that there are interventions in place that can help address any conflicts which may arise, uh, particularly for the students, um, you know, for students who feel oppressed or uh, because of the hierarchical relationship, they may feel helpless. Um, or they may fear the possible repercussions, you know, for coming forward. We, we have to protect that and, and ensure that their complaints are not ignored um, and that the college and the lab also, you know, have processes in place that provide for that support to effectively address those types of concerns. Jane, did you have any thoughts on that? I, I think that um, we need to... I, I feel like a lot of the things that we have problems with in STEM are derived from the fact that we we don't fully respect people. <laughs> and, and once you respect people, a lot of other things sort of fix themselves, right? You can imagine that, you know, if you have some issue with, you know, a student who has to, you know, do things online far away and their teacher is making them get up in the middle of the night, like their teacher is not fully respecting them as humans. They wouldn't want their, their kid to do that, for example, or their, or their sister to do that, for example. And so I, I feel like that basic idea goes across the board and would fix a lot of things. How you get people to change um, hearts and minds I don't have a great answer to, <laughs> but I think a lot of it boils down to that one thing. Yeah, that's good. So, you know, when we talk about the iceberg and then below the iceberg and everything that exists, 
The second half of the movie starts to talk about the repercussions and what happens when those icebergs are ignored, what's, what's happened to the people, especially with Dr. Burks. And there's a very powerful scene, and I'd like to start off with that clip now, where Dr. Burks shares about what it's like to be invisible. Let's take a look. You know, for a long time, you try to fit or put the face forward that you are this, whatever they've built science to be. And you talk a certain way and you look a certain way and you try to fit into that. And even when you do all that, you're still not considered one of them. But you just get used to that. You get used to being invisible in the sciences. Invisible, hypervisible, and probably a, a very powerful statement that all of us will remember, I'm not one of them. Or as Nancy Hopkins said so often in the movie, you know, I didn't have the playbook. What was the playbook? I didn't understand that. I wasn't given that direction. I just wanted to do science. I know, Kim, you mentioned you had a, a very powerful example to share on being invisible. Would you mind sharing that with us now? Sure. And I think uh, the example I shared with you, Susan, is notable because it didn't happen that long ago. So, you know, I've had an extremely successful career and feel like I've established myself in my field. And I was part of a, a large committee and we were having a meeting and discussing something and I made a, what I thought was an important point to the group and the discussion went on. And then someone else on the committee, a man made the exact same point that I did and everyone jumped in. What a great idea. This is so interesting and so important to our discussions. And one of my mentors was also on this group said, yes, that's an excellent idea. And it was also an excellent idea when Kim said it five minutes ago, which I appreciated a lot. But for me, that sense that even now, what do you have to do to be visible in this environment? Um, you know, I've often joked that you know the way, best way to be a woman in science is to be the boss. That certainly is helpful. You can you can garner people's attention, uh, but really, science is built around a culture of respect for your skills and capabilities and your work. And so, I shouldn't have to carry a fancy title for people to listen to what I have to say. Um, the flip side is if I go into that same meeting and I say something, you know, maybe stupid or, you know, uh, something that I regret, everyone will remember that. I've been to numerous meetings where people came up and talked to me uh, because they all remember me because I was unique and that I was one of the few women that they encountered. So it's a double edged sword. In some respects, it's a superpower, uh, but it can be really challenging. So what, what do you say when, when that happened in the committee you're talking about and everyone around the room heard from your mentor who said that? Was that an aha moment like, oh my gosh, yes, of course. Or was it almost that they didn't get it, what, they were, what, what was happening? Uh, the usual reaction is sort of nervous laughter around the table. Oh yes, um, of course, we all meant to acknowledge that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there is some moment of recognition in that, that it wasn't really what people intended. I really don't think everyone sitting around the table thinking, how can we not listen to what Kim has to say? Mm -hmm. um, but they have these invisible filters that are up in the conversation uh, that put emphasis on different participants in ways that they're not fully conscious of. So it's a, it is a moment where people can step back and say, oh, maybe I should listen a little more closely uh, to everyone who's speaking around the table. And that filter that you mentioned leads us to a phrase that we've all heard a lot of in the last couple of years, and that is implicit bias. And that is something we struggle with, something that many of us didn't even really realize we had. Um, Daryl, how do you begin to recognize your own implicit bias? And, and how do we deal with that? Yeah, for me, it, you know, it, it starts with self-awareness because you know, we're really talking about consciously changing our perspective, right? But these are biases and stereotypes that we have grown up with our entire lives. So they are ingrained in who we are and how we see the world and how we 
interact with one another. And, and these are often reinforced on a daily basis by media and, and what we see around us. And so we have to recognize that. Um, I think it goes back to something that Dr. Willingbring mentioned is that we need to focus on seeing people as individuals, right? We need to understand each person's life experiences as a person on an individual level um, and not focusing on those stereotypes um, that we often use to, to define people. And then we also need to come from a place of love and care for one another. I mean, that's really what, what it comes down to. And, and we have to try to see things from another person's perspective. You know, how would you respond if you were in that same position? Or how would you respond if that happened to, you know, someone that you love, right? We have to personalize these experiences for ourselves. And once we personalize it, then we're more uh, adept at being able to take the action because it, it affects all of us. Jason and Monique, I know that both Abel and APAC have focused on implicit bias and the communication that is necessary for us to start to see things in a different light. What are your thoughts on how we can address implicit bias, Jason? Well, we have many different methods. We have endless workshops and trainings for both management and employees. I think it just comes out to getting out of your comfort zone and keeping an open mind. And meeting new people. I mean, we have so many ERGs. Uh, I, I, th I think, if you allow me, we have, I have a family, you know, in the lab. I have a family in the super block. I have a, a family with the Asian Pacific American Council with APAC. And I'm sure that many of you out there, you know, have a family at the lab as well. And the lab has resources. We have work-life balance. And if we participate in the lab events, um, I mean, like this month is Pride Month, so I'm sure that hopefully uh, many of you out there will encourage everyone to, to attend you know, their events and then joining an affinity, uh, join, or join an affinity group. Um, I'm not asking to, to make a commitment, but if you hear other people's stories and, and, and attend you know, with an open mind and, and, and an open heart and with goodwill, um, and, you, and you, you'll start to, to sympathize, to, to gain that empathy. You know, with groups, with people that you would normal, that not normally interact with. And that's the beauty of the ERGs that you have, or, or, or LISA, uh, organization, um, LISA groups that you, you can meet other people in the lab that you wouldn't normally meet. And, and I think that's how you, how, that's one of the ways that you can build community. Monique, how has ABLE been addressing this? I think Jason uh, made such a great point there that it's really through partnering with our fellow ERGs. I've loved when our ERG has been able to partner with APAC, with the Pride Group, um, you know, with the uh, American Indian Group. We've been able to um, hold different panels and such. But I think the most impactful thing we as individuals at the lab can do is to one, not get defensive about our by own biases. You know, I think there's such a defensiveness that can come out of people like, no, I'm not biased. I, I think everybody is the same and I'm colorblind. And um, we actually had a panel discussion about the harm of colorblindness and how it's actually not beneficial for us to be colorblind because the whole reason of increasing diversity in the workplace is to have diversity in the workplace. So if you're saying you're blind to the things that make me a diverse person, that's not helpful to what I bring to the table because I hope to bring my full self to the table and I'm a woman and I'm black and I'm Mexican and um, you know, I come from this mixed background and I'm bringing all of me to the table. And that's the things that make me diverse help make me um, the things that I bring. So I think um, partnering, exposing yourself to other ERGs and not being defensive is a great starting point. One of the basic tenets of science is certainly peer review and publishing in technical journals. And um, we have a video question now from Benji that we'd like to show where he's asking specifically about bias in peer review. Let's take a look. Hello, my name is Benjamin Grover. I am the Deputy Principal Associate Director for Program Enablement and Weapons and Complex Integration. And I'd like your opinion to understand if there's any sexism or discrimination within the peer review process. Have you witnessed this? And if so, how can it be addressed? Kim, can you kick off that discussion for us? Absolutely. And there's been a ton of research on this topic. Uh, you know, people are subject to the same 
uh, implicit and unconscious biases when they're reviewing papers or resumes or uh, you know, any kind of decision-making process uh, that goes on. It's been very well documented. Um, I think what's uh, really challenging about it is that we like to view our environment as, um, as a meritocracy. We're seeking the very best people. So this idea that somehow the simple mention of someone's name can change the way you read their resume is really hard for people to internalize. Um, so processes like uh, blind screening of resumes <clears throat> where identifying information is taken off as a first pass, I think is very important. Um, building in training for people who are gonna do this kind of uh, review, uh, reviewing papers, journal articles, uh, other people's work or resumes, very important. Uh, part of overcoming bias is acknowledging that it exists and being conscious of it. So. I have the same biases that other people do. I grew up in this world as well. So I make a conscious effort to check when I'm looking at something, how I'm interpreting it relative to how I might look at the same piece of work were it uh, a man or someone of a different ethnicity. And so, so building conscious steps and breaks into these systems, I think is really important. Monique, what's been your experience on that? I don't have a lot of experience with the peer review process, actually. Okay. Jane, did that happen to you at all in any of the papers you've published where perhaps your name should have been first and wasn't? Or, or like we saw in the film where we had two same exact resumes that were sent out to hire a grad student and, oh my gosh, well, the woman didn't do as well as the gentleman did, um, but he had, she had exact same qualifications. Yeah, I've definitely had experience with that kind of erasure. Um, and, you know, that's one of the, the hard things, I think, to take. That's one of these like below the iceberg sort of situations where, you know, if you have some overt action that happens, you can like talk to someone about it. You can tell them what happened, get their take, um, you know, maybe do something. But some of these, you know, things that happen are very like almost subversive. And it's hard to know if you're just, you know, bananas and making it up. <laughs> um, but then after enough time has passed and it's happened again and again and again, and you say like, no, there really is something to this. I think that that is, you know, a little bit harder to handle because it's not just like responding to this one thing it's the a series of things that hurt your career over the long term. And you know, it's also a little bit depressing that and they brought this up in in the film is that it's not just men doing it, right? Women are also biased against women and um, you know, people of color can be biased against people of color. So it's really hard when that's the case, because just changing the population doesn't change people's biases in a way that will like over time correct for this. So I don't know if, you know, hopefully we're, we're raising kids in a different way. Um, <laughs> but I'm not sure, I'm not sure we are. And so I think that that's going to be something that takes a long time to turn the ship around. Yeah. And your point is well taken, you know, about that it's not just white men who are doing this to women or diverse groups. And we need to recognize that all of us, you know, have probably done it to each other at some time or another. And how do we correct that implicit bias and move forward as, as part of it? Jane, you know, I got to say, you went through a lot. And oh my gosh, I don't think there was anyone who could not watch the film and feel for you just from the physical as well as the emotional and, and sexual harassment. And so, you know, kudos to you for bringing that Title IX complaint forward. And, and, and I know it was an aha moment for you when you talk about how do we change that stem and how do we change that tide with your daughter and your daughter's love and wanting to be a scientist. So that begs the question, how did you maintain your love for science through all of this? Because you went through a lot um, that no one should have had to have gone through. Oh, well, th thank you for saying that. It's really nice. Um, yeah, I think, 
Um, well, first of all, I just, I just love science. I love doing it. <laughs> um, it's kind of like still how I play. Um, and so I'm, I'm surprised, not surprisingly able to maintain a healthy work-life balance because <laughs> my idea of fun is going on Google scholar on a Friday night. <laughs> um, but I think that, you know, that's not always the case. Um, there have been times when, you know, to be perfectly honest, I was, so sick of some of these things that have happened that I, that I truly only stayed in the field out of spite. And so I think that spite has a big role. Like I didn't want to give them the pleasure of having me leave, you know, and now that people aren't really like, you know, trying to actively push me out of the field anymore, you know, now when I sort of like sort of fall out of love temporarily with science, or, you know, I get bogged down by things that aren't really science that are part of my job. I, um, I just kind of realized that it's, it's okay to have times when you're not that jazzed about it and that you can, you, you can come back to it later. And I think once someone told me that, like, that's okay. It doesn't mean that you've changed. You'll, you'll come back. And sure enough, like, you know, a couple months later when, you know, things kind of settled down and I was able to take some time for, to do the kind of science that I liked, I really, um, you know, went back into like being all excited about science again. So I think people go in and out and it's not like one thing you're always like, you know, super excited about science. I think you can, you can have different states that keep you in the field. And I know, Jason, when you and I spoke, you mentioned your two young daughters and their love for science and, um, and, and you were moved by it. I think a lot of the role models that occurred and we talked a little bit about in the film, the male role models, but I know your young daughters are looking for female role models in science. So how are you helping them start to belong to the world of science and how do we create that culture of belonging? Sure. So when I was growing up, you know, I, I, I didn't have cable, all I had was PBS. So I saw figures like Carl Sagan, um, which I do look to as a role model, uh, Fred Rogers. <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm trying to look for similar role models like those like that I had growing up. Like after Carl Sagan, it was maybe Michio Kaku or uh, Stephen Hawking or Neil deGrasse Tyson. And I'm trying to find equivalent um, uh, communicators like, like them. Um, and, and there are several, uh, for example, Dr. Amy Meinzer, who, who's on PBS, who does some of the interstitials. And you know, there's no, there's no uh, dearth of, of, of female role models out there. For example, out of the news, we have, um, for example, the inventor of CRISPR-Cas9, um, Jennifer Dona. And uh, since the, uh, the landing of the uh, Perseverance rover, we have uh, Swati Mohan, who's part of the EDL. The, uh, and also Mimi Ong, who uh, did uh, ingenuity of uh, the, the helicopter. So there's no uh, lack of role models out there. But uh, when I look to speakers like Rachel Burks, um, we really have to be proactive and, and find role models out there uh, for them. I, I, let me see. And uh, it, it's, it's, it's difficult right now. There, there aren't I can probably count them, you know, with one hand. And yes, we, we have to be the role models for them. That that they that even I'm try the role models that I was looking for growing up, I have to be there for them, if that makes any sense. Well, if you think about the role models, then mm -hmm. that gives young women, young girls the ability to say, I want to belong to that group. I want to mm -hmm. envision and be them. And then that almost mm -hmm. comes full circle because then that creates this love for science that you are part of this group. Monique, you're shaking your head. Tell us how you feel about this. Well, that's the reason I'm an engineer today. My dad, uh, it was really important to him for me. He didn't graduate from high school. So he wanted to put me around people who were educated and he really wanted me to have strong female role models. And so he introduced me to several female scientists at the lab because he actually works at the lab as well. And I met them when I was in middle school and I got to go to their labs and I got to see what they do and touch the chemicals, you know, all safely. 
And it looked like a lot of fun. And I, he remembers me coming to him afterwards and being like, dad, they don't even work. They just have fun. They just love their jobs. And they showed me that science is cool. And um, one of the women I met actually mentored me while I was in college. And so I've be so benefited from having just strong mentors and um, being uh, walked by really strong women in science, um, walked through life by really strong women in science. And so I know I'm an engineer today because of some of the contributions they've made to me. And, and those mentors are so important. As Kim witnessed when she shared her example, it was her, a mentor who stood up and said, hey guys, what, what are we doing here today? So have all of us had strong mentors that allowed us to, I know Jane, you, you had a bad one, but we know you have had good ones in your life as well too. And the importance of those mentors, you know, cannot be dismissed because they can make or break. And had Jane never had a good mentor, just think what would have happened to her. She wouldn't have stayed in science and she wouldn't have been here today as part of that. So now let's go into our third segment, um, panelists, because it leads us to a phrase we've all heard, the leaky pipeline, although I think today we're going to change that paradigm a little bit and talk about maybe something other than that branding of it. But in the film, it does talk about what the leaky pipeline is. And, and for those of you who haven't seen the film, it's essentially the number of people who go into science fields who might drop out during the time frame and then end up not pursuing a career in science, um, not pursuing a degree in science, and how that attrition affects all of us. Let's take a moment to uh, watch this segment of the film. So when I was a freshman in college, my best friend who was also an engineer, and we were sort of like together through the experience, which I think was really important for, for both of our um, retention in the profession, we looked around and we noticed that the classroom was about half women. And um, you know, we, I remember very clearly that we had a conversation about what is all the fuss about? Like there's plenty of women in this classroom. Maybe it's just a matter of time. And, and this is something I still hear. Oh, it's just a matter of time. Um, and we looked around again senior year and there was out of 100 students, seven of us left. And we sort of realized like, oh, this is the leaky pipeline. This is disproportionate attrition. In STEM, we have spent a lot of resources and time to get young girls focused on STEM. Um, so we know that we've been filling the pipeline. Um, the problem is that sexual harassment actually creates many leaks in that pipeline. So we're doing a lot of work, but some of that work is actually being undone. So it's more than a leak, I think, at this point, 50% uh, down to 29%. Monique, what do you think about that term, leaky pipeline? I think a term is only as good as it's able to communicate to others. And um, it seems more of like a broken pipeline at that point. And I think it weighs heavy on my heart because one of my passions is, um, you know, speaking to minorities, minority students, um, women, children of color and encouraging them uh, in STEM and encouraging them to consider STEM and showing them that science is fun. And so, it really impacted me hearing that because we're filling this pipeline. I'm trying to help fill this pipeline with potential, um, you know, scientists, potential engineers, potential mathematicians. And then along the way, they, they don't make it all the way to becoming that, not because they're not excited about it, but because of harassment and because of these really ugly things. And it makes me almost emotional to be encouraging them to pursue this and to have them receive that attack that, you know, gets them off of that pipeline. Yeah. Kim, did you experience that when you were going through school, uh, colleagues who dropped out? And what are your thoughts on that term? Definitely. And I guess one thing that strikes me about the term leaky pipeline is that it implies it's sort of a benign effect. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, women drop out over time and they, they leave the field. It's not benign. Things are happening. The barriers are being created or forces are at work that are driving women out of the field. So it's not benign. And simply putting more women in at the front end so that the relative number that come out the other side or underrepresented minorities isn't the point. Um, I think really what we've not focused on 
is the draw to the end. You know, what is it about the end of your educational career and the entry into the workplace that makes it worthwhile? Science, you know, STEM careers are challenging. That's part of the fun. That's why we stuck. Uh, you know, that outweighed many of these small insults that we encountered over the course of our career. Uh, but for many people, what they see at the end isn't enough to draw them all the way through that arduous process. Mm -hmm. And so I think we need to consider both elements of this. Um, the other thing about focusing on the pipeline is I think it's an easier problem not to increase the numbers, but you can think about things to do. We could try to get more women and minorities interested in science, for example, or we could offer scholarships or summer experiences, et cetera. When you say, okay, what are we going to do that's going to make it look worthwhile, you know, that there are going to be great career opportunities and that they're going to uh, be able to build uh, into whatever type of career they see, that's a little harder to think through. Mm -hmm. And I guess just one last point, trying to be quick, that number, that aggregate number of women who come through the pipeline varies a lot by field. So my field is physics, and that number has been stuck below 20% for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, things have changed a lot, but uh, this, this notion that somehow all the things we're doing are, are really making an enormous difference is really misleading. Great point. And I think social sciences have increased, but the harder sciences have not. And so, you know, there was an interesting, a very valuable opinion piece in um, a tech journal called Advancing Earth and Space Science that Jane shared with us. And I love this analogy because instead of the leaky pipeline, it suggests a braided river, a braided pathway, um, not unlike, Daryl, the guided pathways that I know the community colleges are focusing on to ensure students get into a field and then finalize where they want to go. And it allows this idea, and Jane, I hope you're, you can talk to it for us, that you can enter and go very much what you were talking about before, that you might enter and then go into a different area. And here, here's the graphic that we have. Jane, walk us through this because I know this was very impressive to you. Yeah, I, I really like this uh, analogy a lot more than the idea of a leaky pipeline because, you know, one of the problems with the leaky pipeline is that people who leave academia or, you know, don't continue on in STEM fields, they're not little dribbles on the floor, you know, <laughs> I think that's something that we have to remember. Um, they're incredibly impressive people. The anonymous woman in the, the film who is harassed by my advisor and left before me, she's still amazing. Um, she happens, you know, to work in national security now. And she, um, you know, I don't, I don't like to think of her as, as a puddle on the floor. Um, so I, I would rather think of her as following a different amazing path, which I'm sure she is. And that's another thing, you know, we in, you know, whatever path that we have chosen in particular, we always think that that's like, oh, I'm on the best path. But in fact, whatever gives someone, you know, the life um, that they want, that is an equally valid path. And so I know a lot of times in academia, we think like, oh, if you don't go into academia, you kind of failed or something like that. And I think we have to get rid of that idea. Um, and I, I like how in this uh, example, you know, you have places where people are kind of caught up with a slower channel um, that creates space for life. Sometimes there are things that are blocking the way. I do, like when people were making this, there was a big discussion in our Earth, uh, Earth Science Women's Network uh, chat. <laughs> and everyone's like, wow, if you're flowing downhill, it really makes it seem easy. So <laughs> I think that any analogy is open to criticism. But I really love how you're able to like sort of think about your academic career going into, you know, sort of more of a, a, a different career and then being able in some cases to like come back to that. And so um, I think that this, this one is much, much better. I will say that the other thing about the leaky pipeline is that it's almost perverse to know that women are being harassed and women of color are being harassed in STEM and that we're 
purposely bringing people into that so that the numbers go up. That to me just seems um, really diabolical in a way. Um, and so I spend a lot of time trying to um, create culture changes and, and climate changes in departments um, so that people don't go into the field um, and experience that kind of thing. I think when I look at this, and um, I, I know that I think our, we just took it off the screen, but my first analogy is, oh gosh, I hope what happens in a drought year. <laughs> so we need to make sure we don't have that drought affecting it or that there's an endless pool of, of going on because you could make that analogy. And But I did like in the article, and it's well worth it, and we can share exactly where it was from, that it talked about being able to enter science at any age and that it's not just about continuing up through that education system, which Daryl, as you alluded to is so important, but going back for that second career or maybe having that passion to take out time to raise a family or to pursue business or something else and then coming back. Daryl, I'm wondering what your thoughts were on that uh, graphic. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. I think that's great. I, I think as you mentioned, Susan, that really is aligned with uh, the approach that not only LPC, but community colleges and higher ed in general is taking regarding guided pathways and helping students find their path early on, but really providing those on ramps and off ramps as, as they navigate their careers, I think is, is the right approach. So I, I appreciate um, Dr. William bring uh, sharing that with us. We did receive a question from a student that I think it might be appropriate to share now. Um, and this is from Tegan, and she's asking about the academic journey. So let's listen to that um, about Tegan. Hello, my name is Tegan Zuniga. I just finished my undergrad program and I will be starting my PhD at UC Merced this fall. Over the past year, I was able to be part of the lab's Data Science Summer Institute and to be a fellow with the Livermore Lab Foundation. So my question is somewhat academic in nature. Is there an opportunity to build awareness of harassment issues at, into student educational programs at both the undergrad and the graduate level and to showcase how implicit bias in STEM harms all of us? How can we stop the cycle so that appropriate behavior becomes a cultural norm? So it's a great idea to be able to take not just the STEM learning and, and move it up, but also the social awareness and implicit bias as curriculum. Daryl, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I appreciate it. I, I love the video questions, by the way. So thank you, Tegan, for that, that question. And so you know, to, to her point, you know, colleges and universities, you know, for undergraduate and graduate students, we, we want students to have the technical knowledge to be successful in their careers, but we also are committed to ensuring that each and every one of our students are productive, right, citizens in, in, in their communities and in, in their place of work. And so, you know, we, we've heard a lot about soft skills, and I, I, like, to, I like to call them critical, well-rounded skills. You know, we're talking about being care, uh, caring and thoughtful and empathetic and ethical and just. I mean, these are critical skills, you know, for, for the workplace. And so, um, you know, I, I will share, too, and I, I was following one of the questions in the chat that, you know, based on my exposure uh, to this film and, and this dialogue today, I'm very interested in exploring how we can specifically at LPC incorporate diversity and inclusion specifically in, in STEM majors. I think that certainly is the question and I'm, I'm um, you know, very interested in exploring uh, how we can contribute to this conversation. We do know that all of our degree programs are designed to provide students with that broad breadth, breadth of knowledge. And I know, you know, as the president um, at LPC, I'm, I expect all of our students to have that lens for social justice and to find their voice and their confidence and great, gain greater self-awareness. So as Tegan mentioned, you know, those experiences, those co-curricular experiences are so critical. Um, and so we're committed to providing students with the opportunities to learn, not only through our curriculum, but, you know, there's many leadership opportunities, there's student life opportunities, there's co-curricular opportunities where these critical skills and competencies are, are embedded in, in the educational journey. Um, and so um, I'm um, excited about this conversation and, and bringing um, my learning back to the campus and having these conversations there as well. 
You, know, you, you mentioned that it has been a broad discussion over the last couple of years of social justice issues on, on a myriad of issues. And I know, Jane, this picture of scientists has been shown just about everywhere. I mean, it premiered on NOVA last month uh, for its premiere, but many universities have used the movie just exactly that way as a dialogue and curriculum starter. Do you Can you share a little bit about that and the, the reception that picture of scientists has had because it's been phenomenal? Yeah, it's, I think that the filmmakers expected it to be shown at, you know, maybe a couple dozen institutions, <laughs> um, which is kind of common for a documentary like that. And it's just caught on like wildfire. It's really, it's really amazing. I think that they've had like almost 2000 um, specific events to show it. And then it went on PBS and it'll be on Netflix on the 13th of June, I think. So it'll be there for other people to watch it. Um, and it's just, you know, I've never gotten so many um, emails from nice men <laughs> saying, saying uh, you know, that they are gonna take a good hard look at things that they've done in their life and try to make restitution for them. And, um, you know, it just seems like it's really struck a chord with people. And so I, I always tell people that, I think it's completely appropriate to show to, you know, young adults. I know that there's actually a um, a version of it that you can get that has um, the dirty words bleeped out. It's my personal first time being bleeped. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> so I, t I take a bit of offense, <laughs> but I, um, you know, I, th I would think that it would be something that, you know, if you show it and I would love it if they expanded the, the repertoire um, with a couple other films that talk about, you know, LGBT LGBTQA issues and um, more about uh, racial identity that, you know, we could just have like a series of them that we rotate through and show different ones every year to people coming in. I think that that would really help. It, it seems to have really unlocked a different part of the brain that people have. You know, you can learn about the statistics about how much this affects different people, but I think it kind of gets at, you know, our sitting around a campfire listening to stories brain when we hear how this affects different people. And I think that's exactly what we need. Um, but we can't ask people who've experienced trauma to do that every year, obviously. And that's a perfect segue into our last video question. Um, and that's about lessons learned from Picture a Scientist and how it can be applied. So let's listen to Sheila as we hear from her question. Hello, my name is Sheila Dixon and I'm a resource analyst in the CFO budget office. And I'm also the treasurer of the Lawrence Livermore Laboratories Women's Association. As we've witnessed in 2020 and this year as well, harassment and discrimination isn't just gender specific or unique to STEM. It can be felt across many cultural, ethnic, and racial groups. What are the lessons learned from picture of scientists that can be applied to other audiences experiencing similar issues? Jane, I want to kick that back to you quickly, and then if anyone else has any lessons learned that they might have experienced watching the film, especially Jason and Monique, and how it might be applied to other disparate group and Daryl, please please weigh in. So, Jane, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think I think it goes back to just to be super brief the the bystander thing, and just thinking about how many times this comes up in our lives, and you know, I always. Um, I'm, I'm in, uh, I do martial arts, <laughs> at least I used to do more. <laughs> and one of the things that we learned is in order to do something as a reflex, you have to practice it over and over and over so that it becomes like second nature to you. And so I love the idea of the um, moments that matter idea, uh, because that's something that you really have to like pound into people's brains. They're like, this is what you you know, think about ways that you could respond to this in different situations, because otherwise you'll be caught off guard and it'll, the moment will pass. So, good. So I, I think that moment analogy takes us to maybe our two final questions of our panelists, and then we can open it up for all questions of our audience members. And, you know, moments lead to 
talks lead to longer segues. So Daryl, how do we make sure that diversity, equity, inclusion is not just talking the talk, but walking the walk? Yeah, great question. Um, you know, I first want to acknowledge that having the talk is critically important, right? It has to start with this dialogue and this conversation is uh, a perfect example. So I, I appreciate um, this opportunity for us to engage in this dialogue. You know, it came up a lot. Um, Dr. William Bring mentioned, you know, the importance and really understanding the organizational culture, right? What we're experiencing, it's systemic. It's been embedded in, in how our organizations have been built. And so it takes time to change culture. Um, but but it has to, to start with being brave and being bold enough to listen, to be inclusive, to hear from our colleagues and to understand their experiences. I mean, the stories, the personal stories matter, right? And it also requires us to look in the mirror and take responsibility and own it uh, and recognize that we are not perfect um, and we have opportunities to improve and to create a more welcoming and inclusive working environment for our employees. Um, our employees, our colleagues deserve it, right? And it, it's, it's not easy. There's gonna be difficult conversations. It's gonna be uncomfortable. There's gonna be discomfort. But that's how we know we're making progress is when we're facing those uncomfortable situations and we have to be willing to work through it. Um, you know, the last thing that I'll, I'll, I'll share in terms of being able to walk the walk is um, really just identifying the practices, the policies, the procedures, and the behaviors that need to change. Uh, there's enough data. We know the data, right? Now we really need to roll up our sleeves and really start to identify some actionable systemic changes that will change our culture of our institutions and our organizations uh, in a way that, that our, our employees and our colleagues deserve. And I know, Kim, you've been thinking about this as well, especially with some of the survey work that's gone out at the lab and the senior management team came up with some values that were quite powerful that were put out to all employees. And it goes along with kind of a great phrase in the movie that I believe Dr. Burks um, resonated where we have to go past that culture of compliance to a culture of change. How, how do we do that? And, and I know you are having some great leadership efforts in this area. So share a little bit about that with us. I think, uh, first of all, I'd like to just echo what Dr. Foster said. The first thing is you have to embrace the discomfort and talk about it. This, this is not something that's gonna be easy um, or comfortable. And that's why we're still in this situation. So that emphasis on communicating uh, and being human, you know, this is difficult for everybody. Uh, but we're in it together and we can work through these things. The other thing is being purposeful. And this is a word I've used a lot here. You know, I've talked about culture as being the water in which we swim, right? You don't even see it after a while. And so you have to be conscious of what the environment really looks like. Take a step back, ask someone who's new to the culture, how does it feel here to you? They notice things that we don't notice. And then I think the, uh, last part on change is, you know, people talk about culture change as though it's something that will be done to them. Mm. We create the culture. So you have to embrace that. I am accountable and responsible for the environment I create around me. If I behave differently, I can get people around me to behave differently as well. They will respond to the cues and the, uh, the um, ideas and the vibe I put out into my local environment. So helping people understand that this is not a passive activity this is something we're going to do and build not something that we're going to um you know apply to you when you come into our environment i think that's important well said well that brings us to the final section of our program and those are the questions from our audience members i'm going to ask sally allen from the livermore lab foundation to join us on screen and sally um i know you've been monitoring the questions and so what is the first question for our panelists thank you susan we have had an amazingly rich dialogue happening in parallel to today's webinar lots of fantastic very honest comments from folks and a number of questions. We will try to get to as many as we can today. The probably the number one question that we had was about microaggressions. So the question was, I often don't recognize microaggressions, even when they happen to me in the moment. Generally, I recognize them much later and by the time the moment has passed. So do you have any advice on whether it is appropriate to address these 
quote unquote inconsequential issues after the fact? And if so, how do we go about doing so? Well, Jane, you addressed them years after the fact. So why don't you kick us off on that? But then I would ask any of our other panelists to, you know, maybe give an example of when they addressed it immediately, because it is about, you know, not being that bystander. So Jane? Yeah, I, I'm the same way. It, it takes me a lot. Um, I think in part, it takes a lot to happen for me to even realize that something's happened. Like usually, you know, I'll get a look from a, a friend or something like that in a faculty meeting and I'll be like, oh yeah, that was a, that was really problematic what he just said. <laughs> and uh, I think it's really important to have a team of people for that reason, because sometimes people are, are just not good. You know, they're thinking about other things. Um, I'm personally ADHD, so it's hard for me to like navigate many, many paths. I've been super impressed with um, Kim, by the way, for being able to answer things and do all the typing that she has, just putting that out there. <laughs> Level 10 uh, multitasking there. Um, so I think that just teaming up with some people who are good at it, because some people are just like right on it. Um, but I think that, you know, one, one thing that is really helpful I've found in like actually not just calling people out, but creating change is that often the best time is afterward because you don't necessarily want to um, make someone standoffish or embarrass them in the moment. You wanna make it where everybody's kind of neutral, no one has charged emotions and then you know bring it to them when everyone's thinking straight. What's that advice that our mother always told us to sleep on it overnight and then come back the next day after you've had a chance to cool down when cooler heads might prevail, but you're not then doing a microaggression back to them by calling out their behavior at the exact same time. Any other thoughts, panelists, or should we move to the next question? Well, I just wanted to add, sometimes though, the silence can be really damaging for people who want you to speak up. So if you're in a, a position of power and someone is, you know, is harmed in a meeting and someone didn't speak up, I think that that is something that you need to revisit as well. You can't just talk to the person. You need to, you know, circle back and say, um, you know, I talked to him about this. I don't think it was okay either. Right. Setting that example. Great point, Jane. Thank you. Sally, what's our next question? So our next question, I'm combining a few that had similar, were in a similar vein. Um, what is the most effective way to respond to a man who says, you're wrong, it's not because of your gender, it happens to everyone. And how can you do that in a way that you're not worried about impacting your career prospects? Kim, I am gonna direct this to you. I knew you were gonna do that. <laughs> um, that's a tricky situation because it sort of depends on what happened, right? I mean, I think I would ask questions. I, you know, is this a question of factual accuracy or opinion? You know, I was, um, I was in a situation recently with someone where I was, I'd given some feedback and they came back to me and they said, well, I thought a lot about your feedback and, and I still think you're wrong. And I said, it's not a question of right or wrong. It just is right? You, you don't get to decide how other people feel about what you do. Um, so I think asking questions, probing a little bit, uh, reflecting, you know, sometimes we are wrong. And I think it's important to always have that in the back of your mind, make it make a quick check and say, is there something here that I'm contributing? Uh, that's doing that. Uh, but but approaching it as an opportunity to learn more about, you know, their perspective on what's happening. Great point. Alex. A quick follow up to that was, oh, I apologize. That's okay. Specifically directed at Jane, um, a number of people wanted to know what would you have said to Adam at the time if he had asked you, does this bother you? Oh, I don't know. I mean, so I would have said that there's nothing anyone can do. And I think that that's why he didn't ask that was because we were both not in really in positions of power, you know? Um, and so it would have been just stating the, I thought obvious, um, <laughs> I guess he didn't realize, you know, it was a really hard situation to navigate. And, you know, 
I had learned, and I think many women learn that the way that you respond to problematic treatment is not crying, right? And so I think that, you know, that has that, you know, kind of using those not crying muscles has been helpful to me in my career, but it also makes it so that I don't necessarily convey every single thing that happens to me and how it impacts me. And so I think that that's something that, you know, please assume that people <laughs> have more feelings than they are showing through their tears. <laughs> um, I think that that's probably, you know, um, kind of a universal thing. And that a lot of people who don't complain about things have absolutely have a right to complain about things. Would they let themselves, right? So that didn't really answer the question, but those no. are all I have to say about it. <laughs> it, it did, and it reminded me in the, in the film where um, Adam mentioned that he, um, he thought Dave Marchand did it more because it didn't seem to bother you, because you didn't have a reaction. And so to your point, just because I don't have a reaction doesn't mean it isn't the, aren't those microaggressions. And you don't know, as Kim pointed out, my point of view on this. So I think you don't necessarily need to cry. Women are told they can't cry in business and life and career, but it doesn't mean that they aren't real emotions that are there as part of that. Great point. Yeah. I mean, he told me I'm going to make you cry today. So that like on a daily basis. So that made me want to not cry. Um, other people might handle that differently. Maybe I should have tried it. <laughs> I don't know. Hard, hard thing to navigate. Sally, do we have another question? Thank you for sharing that, Jane. A number of people had that question for other, if other panelists want to chime in as well. Um, the next question was about how to expand the audience for and reach for conversations like this. One of our audience members organized a screening of this very film at their school, and they said about 95% of the attendees were women. So that was a question people were interested in about today as well. And we will do our best to follow up to see who attended today. But if anyone can comment again on how to expand the reach and of the audience. Daryl, I'm wondering if you could talk, because I think you have a natural audience at the school that was certainly broader than just women. Yeah, absolutely. I, I will commit now to saying that we will certainly, whatever it, it takes to to provide, uh, you know, screening uh, at Las Positas College, we certainly will do that. Um, I think the other piece is, is me sharing uh, this opportunity with my colleagues, you know, uh, at other colleges, universities. I think it's just a great opportunity to engage in dialogue that is important, that's necessary um, for all of us. Um, and so I, I just uh, appreciate uh, that suggestion and, and I'll make that commitment. Um, and I think that's just one simple way um, from my lens uh, that I can help um, continue these conversations. Monique and Jason, I know that you also from your ERG groups have done a lot of effort and work on this. So is there any thoughts that you might have as how it could be expanded? Yeah, I think for us and ABLE, when we put on events that we want to sort of be provocative in thought and helping us to sort of tackle these larger issues of bias, et cetera, we're like, how do we make sure it's not just us in the room? How do we make sure like the people that we would really want to hear and learn and be challenged in these things are present? And I think that's a very difficult question to answer for us. And some of the ways we've tried to make sure that that happens is by partnering with our leadership. Um, we have a really great uh, partnership with Glenn Fox, who's one of the ADs at the lab and he, um, and helping us to sort of like, if it's important to the people at the top, they can help make it important to the people beneath them and they can help make it important to the people beneath them. And so I think starting with the people at top and if you can really um, work with people who are in uh, powerful positions, um, that, that's beneficial to you. Jason, any final thoughts? I think Monique said it best. Um, we have, uh, our champion, our ally in senior management, Paul Ellenbach, and if we have any other, if we have any issues, um, you know, we, we discuss it with him. Um, we don't filter it, and it seems like whatever he says gets relayed directly to the senior management team. So we're happy to have that 
dialogue, uh, you know, that ally in senior management that has that ear. Um, and when, when I was asked for, first asked to participate on this panel, um, I went straight to our, our, our APAC board, which is a lot, majority um, female, and, and talked about their experiences and, and how maybe best I could be an ally. So yes, I will certainly you know, go into conversations coming back to our ERG and see how, how we could use this as a tool. Um, and also maybe for their partner with, with other ERGs as well on this. Sally, thank you. Sally, thank you for bringing those questions forward. And we're going to just allow our panelists now a few moments to wrap up um, as we conclude our time. So thank you, Jason and Monique. Um, Dr. Foster, any final words? Yeah, I appreciate this, this conversation. Is, it was a, an honor to be on the panel with each of the panelists today. Um, thank you, Susan. You know, these conversations and these dialogues are, are critically important, as we know, and, and they certainly need to continue, but they also need to be followed uh, with actions and, and changes, right? Nothing changes if nothing changes. So really committing to those actions. Um, I think also understand that we all have a responsibility in this. We're all in this together. No one is alone. Uh, no one should be made to feel alone. Uh, we have to continue to support one another. Um, and we need to call out injustices when we see it. Um, and, and we need to be courageous and bold in that, in that matter. Uh, the last thing that I'll share is, you know, leadership matters, representation matters. And I, I just wanna applaud Kim and, and her leadership. Um, that matters. Um, and so um, I, I, I wanna acknowledge how important leadership is um, in these conversations as well. Thank you, Daryl. Kim, mm -hmm. any final thoughts? Um, I definitely would like to say thank you uh, for being able to part, you know, inviting me to participate in the panel and for the wonderful job you did, Susan and Sally, in, in shepherding us through this conversation and this wonderful panel of people. Uh, and I just um, want to note that this is not just about women and minorities in science. This is a problem for everybody. It's not a question of should we focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion or excellence and innovation. There will not be excellence and innovation if we can't embrace everybody's contributions. And so this really is central to um, our success. Thanks. And Jane, Dr. Willenbrink, thank you as a film person who was in this film and experienced it for sharing what a very personal story this is. We are inspired by you being here today. Any final thoughts? Oh, well, thank you so much for having me. And I, I, you know, a lot of this is a bit of a bummer to talk about some of this stuff. Um, but I, I find that I'm really invigorated and inspired thinking about how, um, you know, scientists, science culture has been one way for a long time. And so it seems like a really hard problem, but it's also shaped by everything that we do every day. And so to me, that's very inspiring thinking that I can go out and change the culture immediately with the people around me. So that's, that's something that I, I always think about and it always makes me smile. Thank you, Jane. And thank you to all of our panelists and our viewers for joining us. Uh, this panel discussion will be available on the Livermore Lab Foundation YouTube channel in a few days. We encourage you to keep this discussion alive and share it with others so they might also be able to decide how we should all picture a scientist. On behalf of the Livermore Lab Foundation, the Labs Women's Association and Diversity, Equity and Inclusion, I'm Susan Houghton and we all hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you. Look at the talent of these women. This is what you lose when you do not solve this problem. That's really what it's about. It's about the science.